This is the Mindful Heart Hears, and you are listening to the Harvest of the Native Americans. The following true story is an excerpt from Indian Boyhood by Charles A. Eastman. Some minor adaptions have been made to the text in order to provide greater clarity. As a people, the Native Americans can live without food much longer than any other nation. In times of famine, the adults often denied themselves in order to make food last as long as possible for the children, who were not able to bear hunger as well as the old. I once passed through one of these hard springs when we had nothing to eat for several days. I well remember the six small birds, which constituted breakfast for six families one morning. And then we had no dinner or supper to follow. What a relief that was to me, although I had only a small wing of a small bird for my share. Soon after this, we came into a region where buffalo were plenty, and hunger and scarcity were forgotten. Such was the Native American's wildlife. When game was to be had and the sun shone, they easily forgot the bitter experiences of the winter before. Little preparation was made for the future. They are children of nature and occasionally she whips them with the lashes of experience. Yet they are forgetful and careless. Much of their suffering might have been prevented by a little calculation. During the summer, when nature is at her best and provides abundantly for the Native Americans, it seems to me that no life is happier than theirs. Food is free, lodging free, everything free. All were alike rich in the summer, and again, all were alike poor in the winter and early spring. However, their diseases were fewer and not so destructive as now, and the Indian's health was generally good. The Indian boy enjoyed such a life as almost all boys dream of and would choose for themselves if they were permitted to do so. The raids made upon our people by other tribes were frequent, and we had to be constantly on the watch. I remember at one time a night attack was made upon our camp and all our ponies stampeded. Only a few of them were recovered, and our journeys after this misfortune were affected mostly by means of the dog travaux. It is wonderful that any children grew up through all the exposures and hardships that we suffered in those days. The frail teepee pitched anywhere, in the winter as well as in the summer, was all the protection that we had against cold and storms. I can recall times when we were snowed in and it was very difficult to get fuel. We were once three days without much fire, and all of this time it stormed violently. There seemed to be no special anxiety on the part of our people. They rather looked upon all this as a matter of course, knowing that the storm would cease when the time came. I could once endure as much cold and hunger as any of them. But now, if I miss one meal or accidentally wet my feet, I feel it as much as if I had never lived in the manner I have described. When it was a matter of course to get myself soaking wet many times, even if there was plenty to eat, it was thought better for us to practice fasting sometimes. And hard exercise was kept up, continually, both for the sake of health and to prepare the body for the extraordinary exertions that it might, at any moment, be required to undergo. In my own remembrance, my uncle used often to bring home a deer on his shoulder. The distance was sometimes considerable, yet he did not consider it any sort of a feat. The usual custom with us was to eat only two meals a day, and these were served at each end of the day. This rule was not invariable, however, for if there should be any callers, it was Indian etiquette to offer either tobacco or food, or both. The rule of two meals a day was more closely observed by the men, especially the younger men, than by the women and children. This was when the Indians recognized that a true manhood, one of physical activity and endurance, depends upon dieting and regular exercise. As a motherless child, I always regarded my good grandmother as the wisest of guides and the best of protectors. It was not long before I began to realize her superiority to most of her contemporaries. This idea was not gained entirely from my own observation, but also from a knowledge of the high regard in which she was held by other women. 
Aside from her native talent and ingenuity, she was endowed with a truly wonderful memory. No other midwife in her day and tribe could compete with her in skill and judgment. Her observations and practice were all preserved in her mind for reference, as systematically as if they had been written upon the pages of a notebook. I distinctly recall one occasion when she took me with her into the woods in search of certain medicinal roots. Why do you not use all kinds of roots for medicines? said I. Because, she replied, in her quick, characteristic manner, the great mystery does not will us to find things too easily. In that case, everybody would be a medicine giver. And Ohaisa must learn that there are many secrets which the great mystery will disclose only to the most worthy. Only those who seek him fasting and in solitude will receive his signs. With this and many similar explanations, she wrought in my soul wonderful and lively conceptions of the great mystery and of the effects of prayer and solitude. I continued my childish questioning. But why did you not dig those plants that we saw in the woods of the same kind that you are digging now? For the same reason that we do not like the berries we find in the shadow of deep woods as well as the ones which grow in sunny places, the latter have more sweetness and flavor. Those herbs which have medicinal virtues should be sought in a place that is neither too wet nor too dry, and where they have a generous amount of sunshine to maintain their vigor. Some day, Ohaisa will be old enough to know of the secrets of medicine. Then I will tell him all. But if you should grow up to be a bad man, I must withhold these treasures from you and give them to your brother. For a medicine man must be a good and wise man. I hope Aisa will be a great medicine man when he grows up. To be a great warrior is a noble ambition, but to be a mighty medicine man is a nobler. She said these things so thoughtfully and impressively that I cannot but feel and remember them even to this day. Our native woman gathered all the wild rice, roots, berries, and fruits, which formed an important part of our food. This was distinctively a woman's work. Unchida, my grandmother, understood these matters perfectly, and it became a kind of instinct with her to know just where to look for each edible variety and what season of the year. This sort of labor gave Indian women every opportunity to observe and study nature after their fashion, and in this Unchida was more acute than most of the men. The abilities of her boys were not all inherited from their father. Indeed, the stronger family traits came obviously from her. She was a leader among the native women, and they came to her not only for medicinal aid, but for advice in all their affairs. With the first March thaw, the thoughts of the Indian woman of my childhood days turned promptly to the annual sugar-making. This industry was chiefly followed by the old men and women and the children. The rest of the tribe went out upon the spring fur hunt at this season, leaving us at home to make the sugar. The first and most important of the necessary utensils were the huge kettles for boiling. Everything else could be made, but these must be bought, baked, or borrowed. A maple tree was felled, and a log canoe hollowed out, into which the sap was to be gathered. Little troughs of basswood and birchen basins were also made to receive the sweet drops as they trickled from the tree. As soon as these labors were accomplished, we all proceeded to the bark sugar house, which stood in the midst of a fine grove of maples on the bank of the Minnesota River. We found this hut partially filled with the snows of winter and the withered leaves of the preceding autumn, and it must be cleared for our use. In the meantime, a tent was pitched outside for a few days' occupancy. The snow still deep in the woods, with a solid crust upon which we could easily walk. For we usually moved to the sugar house before the sap had actually started, the better to complete our preparations. My grandmother worked like a beaver in these days, or rather like a muskrat, as the Indians say, for this industrious little animal sometimes collects as many as six or eight bushels of edible roots for the winter, 
only to be robbed of his store by some of our people. If there was a prospect of a good sugaring season, she now made a second and even a third canoe to contain the sap. These canoes were afterward utilized by the hunters for their proper purpose. My grandmother did not confine herself to canoe making. She also collected a good supply of fuel for the fires, for she would not have much time to gather wood when the sap began to flow. Presently the weather moderated and the snow began to melt. The month of April brought showers, which carried most of it off into the river. Now the women began to test the trees, moving leisurely among them, axe in hand, and striking a single quick blow to see if the sap would appear. The trees, like people, have their individual characters. Some were ready to yield up their lifeblood, while others were more reluctant. Now, one of the birch basins was set under each tree, and a hardwood chip driven deep into the cut which the axe had made. From the corners of this chip at first, drop by drop, then more freely the sap trickled into the little dishes. It is usual to make sugar from maples, but several other trees were also tapped by the Indians. From the birch and ash was made a dark-colored sugar, with a somewhat bitter taste, which was used for medicinal purposes. The box elder yielded a beautiful white sugar, whose only fault was that there was never enough of it. A long fire was now made in the sugar house, and a row of kettles suspended over the blaze. The sap was collected by the woman in tin or birchen buckets and poured into the canoes, from which the kettles were kept filled. The hearts of the boys beat high with pleasant anticipations when they heard the welcome hissing sound of the boiling sap. Each boy claimed one kettle for his special charge. It was his duty to see the fire was kept up under it, to watch lest it boil over, and finally, when the sap became syrup, to test it upon the snow, dipping it out with a wooden paddle. So frequent were these tests that for the first day or two we consumed nearly all that could be made, and it was not until the sweetness began to pall that my grandmother set herself in earnest to store up sugar for future use. She made it into cakes of various forms, in birchant molds, and sometimes in hollow canes or reeds, and the bills of ducks and geese. Some of it was pulverized and packed in rawhide cases. Being a prudent woman, she did not give it to us after the first month or so, except upon special occasions, and it was thus made to last almost the year round. The smaller counties were reserved as an occasional treat for the little fellows, and the sugar was eaten at feasts with wild rice or parched corn, and also with pounded dried meat. Every pursuit has its trials and anxieties. My grandmother's special tribulations during the sugaring season were the upsetting and gnawing of holes in her birch bark pans. The transgressors were the rabbits and squirrel tribes, and we little boys for once became useful. In shooting them with our bows and arrows, we hunted all over the sugar camp until the little creatures were fairly driven out of the neighborhood. Occasionally, one of my older brothers brought home a rabbit or two, and then we had a feast. The sugaring season extended well into April, and the returning birds made the precincts of our camp joyful with their songs. I often followed my older brothers into the woods, although I was then four or five years old. Upon one of these excursions, they went so far that I ventured back alone. When within sight of our hut, I saw a chipmunk sitting upon a log, and uttering the sound he makes when he calls his mate, how glorious it would be, I thought, if I could shoot him with my tiny bow and arrows. Stealthily and cautiously I approached, keeping my eyes upon the pretty little animal, and just as I was about to let fly my shaft, I heard a hissing noise at my feet. There lay a horrid snake, coiled and ready to spring. Forgetful that I was a warrior, I gave a loud scream and started backwards, but soon recollecting myself looked down with shame, although no one was near. However, I retreated to the inclined trunk of a fallen tree, and there, as I have often been told, was overheard soliloquizing in the following words, I wonder if a snake can climb a tree. When our people lived in Minnesota, 
a good part of their natural subsistence was furnished by the wild rice, which grew abundantly in all of that region. Around the shores and all over some of the innumerable lakes of the land of sky-blue water was this wild cereal found. The wild rice harvesters came in groups of 15 to 20 families to a lake, depending upon the size of the harvest. Some of the Indians hunted buffalo upon the prairie at this season, but there were more who preferred to go to the lakes to gather wild rice, fish, gather berries, and hunt the deer. There was an abundance of waterfowls among the grain, and really no season of the year was happier than this. The camping ground was usually an attractive spot, with shade and cool breezes off the water. The people, while they pitched their teepees upon the heights, if possible for the sake of a good outlook, actually lived in their canoes upon the placid waters. The happiest of all, perhaps, were the young maidens, who were all day long in their canoes, in twos or threes, and when they tired of gathering the wild cereal, would sit in the boats doing their needlework. These maidens learned to imitate calls of the different waterfowls as a sort of signal to the members of a group. Even the old woman and the boys adopted signals, so that while the population of the village was lost to sight in a thick field of wild rice, a meeting could be arranged without calling anyone by his or her own name. It was a great convenience for those young men who saw opportunity to meet certain maidens, for there were many canoe paths through the rice. August is the harvest month. There are many preliminary feasts of fish, ducks, and venison, and offerings in honor of the water chief, so that there might not be any drowning accident during the harvest. The preparation consisted of a series of feasts and offerings for many days, while women and men were making birch canoes, for nearly every member of the family must be provided with one for this occasion. The blueberry and huckleberry picking also preceded the rice gathering. There were several events which enlivened the camp of the harvesters, such as maiden feasts, dances, and a canoe regatta or two, in which not only the men were participants, but women and young girls as well. On the appointed day, all the canoes were carried to the shore and placed upon the water with prayer and propitiatory offerings. Each family took possession of one allotted field and tied all the grain in bundles of convenient size, allowing it to stand for a few days. Then they again entered the lake, assigning two persons to each canoe. One manipulated the paddle, while the foremost one gently drew the heads of each bundle toward him and gave it a few strokes with a light rod. This caused the rice to fall into the bottom of the craft. The field was traversed in this manner back and forth until finished. This was the pleasantest and easiest part of the harvest toil. The real work was when they prepared the rice for use. First of all, it must be made perfectly dry. They would spread it upon buffalo robes and mats, and sometimes upon layers of coarse swamp grass, and dry it in the sun. If the time was short, they would make a scaffold and spread upon it a certain thickness of the green grass and afterward the rice. Under this a fire was made, taking care that the grass did not catch fire. When all the rice is gathered and dried, the holing begins. A round hole is dug about two feet deep and the same in diameter. Then the rice is heated over a fireplace and emptied into the hole while it is hot. A young man, having washed his feet and put on a new pair of moccasins, treads upon it until all is hold. The woman then pour it upon a robe and begin to shake it, so that the shaft will be separated by the wind. Some of the rice is browned before being hold. During the holing time, there were prizes offered to the young men who can hold quickest and best. There were sometimes from twenty to fifty youths dancing with their feet in these holes. Pretty moccasins were brought by shy mayor to the use of their choice, asking them to hold rice. There were daily entertainments which deserved some such name as holing bee. At any rate, we all enjoyed them thoroughly. The girls brought with them plenty of good things to eat. When all the rice was prepared for the table, the matter of storing it had to be determined. Caches were dug by each family in a concealed spot and carefully lined with dry grass and bark. Here they left their surplus stores for a time of need. Our people were very ingenious in covering up all traces of the hidden food. A common trick 
was to build a fire on top of the mound. As much of the rice as could be carried conveniently was packed in cases made of rawhide and brought back with us to our village. After all, the wild Indians could not be justly termed improvident when their manner of life is taken into consideration. They let nothing go to waste and labored incessantly during the summer and fall to lay up provisions for the inclement season. Berries of all kinds were industriously gathered and dried in the sun. Even the wild cherries were pounded up, stones and all, made into small cakes and dried for use in soups and for mixing with the pounded jerked meat and fat to form a much-prized Indian delicacy. <laughs> ¶¶